Today at the National Press Club, former Defence Department Secretary Dennis Richardson and former Deputy Secretary Paul Dibb. As Russia's war on Ukraine intensifies, what are the global and domestic implications? Dennis Richardson and Paul Dibb with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra and today's Westpac address. I'm Laura Tingle, the club's president. Vladimir Putin's bloody assault on Ukraine has not just upended the lives of millions of Ukrainians, but opened a new strategic chapter in European history and new challenges for the wider world. Who better then to assess these developments and what they mean for Australia than two of the country's most eminent strategic thinkers and practitioners, whose personal experience and knowledge goes back to the days of the USSR. <coughs> Paul Dibb, Emeritus Professor of Strategic Studies at the, Strate at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, will address us first. He held senior positions in the National Security and Intelligence Establishment during the dying days of the Soviet Union and was also the author of the 1986 Review of Australia's Defence Capabilities and primary author of the 1987 Defence White Paper. Dennis Richardson has been one of Australia's most senior public servants, having headed ASIO, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of Defence. He was also Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Bob Hawke in 1990 and 1991 during the tumultuous collapse of the USSR and is a former ambassador to Washington. He will comment on Paul Dibb's speech before we move to questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Dibb. Thank you, Laura. Um, I spent 20 years of my life almost full time on the, the Soviet Union. And you know, nothing much has changed. Um, there's a famous book by a man called Orlando Figs, um, based on his PhD, and it's called Russia, Tragedy of a Nation. And I want to pursue that with you. Um, it'll be pretty serious what I'm talking about. It's a dangerous situation, potentially, and it could be really dangerous. So I hope at the end of it, you all don't want to go out and commit ritual suicide. Um, these are trying and very dangerous times. It's a dangerous moment for global security because Europe's security order is being fundamentally challenged. Basically, Everything that was established in the wake of the Second World War in terms of uh, Europe's security is being directly challenged by this attack by Russia, this war on Russia. And you're all watching it on TV. Um, and what is so disturbing, if I might say so, is these are basically European countries that are in conflict. They go back to a thousand years of Christianity out of Kiev in 988. Um, it is true that they both missed the Renaissance and the Reformation, and that's important. And they both came very late to the Industrial Revolution. But when you watch, you know you're in European cities. And the landscape of bombing and the intensity reminds me of the photographs of Germany and parts of Britain in the Second World War. Who would have thought in 2022 we would have come to this remove? And we're on the precipice in many ways. There is a real risk of escalation to nuclear war. And let me remind you that Russia's military doctrine is very clear. It's about two years old and it says in the event uh, that Russia is being attacked on its own territory, or whatever it def defines as its own territory, by an overwhelmingly technologically superior conventional force, meaning NATO, it will have the right to recourse to tactical nuclear weapons. Now, just think about that. We might come back to it. Is this era more dangerous than the Cold War? Quite a lot of academic colleagues are 
bandying around, you know, Cold War, Mark II and so on. As in all these complex issues of policy, it is, has some similarities and some differences. And Cold War Mark II, I don't care to use. Why? We forget that those of us who worked intensively throughout the Cold War period, as I did in the intelligence game, we forget two things about it. One, the risk of global nuclear war was never far away. And on a number of occasions, it wasn't just the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was the 1983 NATO Able Archer exercise and everything that surrounded that. What is different, and this was explained to me in Moscow last time I was there five years ago now, Paul, we no longer, like we did in the Cold War, we're no longer talking to the Americans in detail about strategic nuclear arms control and disarmament. We need to remember in the Cold War, we had SALT I, SALT II, uh, the New START Treaty, the Theater and Nuclear Forces Agreement, uh, the Open Skies Agreement, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. All those have been canceled except for the New START Agreement, which limits each side to 1,500 strategic nuclear missiles, ample to terminate both countries as modern functioning societies. And just let me briefly remind you that Australia played a key role in the, that issue of monitoring uh, Soviet um, conformity with uh, strategic missile numbers, characteristics, numbers of warheads and locations, um, thanks to the joint US-Australian uh, facilities at Pine Gap and Narunga. We were central to American confidence in that business of being able to reinsure America that the Russians were basically abiding by the counting rules. I want to examine Putin's mindset in this short speech, as a good intelligence officer should attempt to do. Try and get inside them. Fundamentally, and being very uh, crude about it, Putin views Europe as weak and divided, and until recently, by the way, it would have every reason to believe that. And he views the United States, and he's not alone in this, as a decline in power, as does his great ally, Xi Jinping. And we need to remember now that China and Russia are de facto allies. And I've written about this um, in various ASPI publications two years ago. Before I get on to the main points, I just want to quote from uh, today's Moscow Carnegie Foundation, Alexandra Gabriev, um, who is a member of the Moscow Carnegie um, Institute. And he just said in a release today, the ugliest days of this war are in front of us, not behind us. And he's just quitting the country he was born in to go and live in America. And he's not alone in that. First then, what motivates Putin? I've got four points. First, what he sees as the humiliation of the collapse of the Soviet Union and how the United States took advantage of a gravely weakened Russia. When we think about the Soviet superpower, and that's another term that's bandied around by some of my colleagues, India is not a superpower, neither is China. What makes a superpower is global strategic nuclear reach capable of devastating any country, and secondly, global conventional reach anywhere in the world. China can't do that right now. India certainly can't. And Russia, in the Soviet times, struggled a bit. But let me remind you, at the peak of its power in the early 80s, it had 12,000 strategic nuclear warheads, 300 army divisions, 50,000 tanks, 5,000 combat aircraft, 500 combat warships, including, by the way, 94 nuclear attack submarines, if that's an interesting figure. Putin uses words like, we were not just plundered in the collapse of the Soviet Union, we were robbed. And he quotes the taking away of Crimea. Uh, 
There are different views in the literature, and there are two very good books out, by the way, one called Collapse uh, by um, uh, Vladimir um, Zubok out of the London School of Economics, ex-Soviet citizen. It, I commend it to you. It's really worth reading. And the other one is called Not One Inch. Um, she is Yale University. Um, and again, with both of them, there are hundreds of pages of endnotes where they're quoting from documents, not people's opinion. And I want you to remember that because I'm going to come back to some um, quotations that not everybody in this town understands. There are different views. The typical American view is we won the Cold War. No, they didn't. The Soviet Union defeated itself. It could have gone on for another number of decades. Look at North Korea. Look at Vietnam. It was Gorbachev's anxiety to bring about rapid reform, particularly of the political situation and the ruling party, the Communist Party, that undid the Soviet Union. Let me just give you a couple of other examples from what one of these two books I've mentioned. In 1990, when Gorbachev was still the General Secretary of the Communist Party, he had discussions with George Bush Sr. and said to George Bush, my economy is collapsing, and indeed it was. It collapsed by 41% in the first 12 months. I badly need a Marshall Plan. Uh, George Bush says, how much do you want, Corby? Oh, between 100 billion US and 150 billion US. In those days, serious money. Gorby, I'd love to help you, but I've got a few budgetary problems of my own. And that was pretty well it, except that evening, the Secretary of the US Treasury, Nicholas Brady, says to George Bush Sr., we shouldn't be giving any economic assistance to this disintegrating country. Our strategic aim of the United States should be reduce them to a third-rate power. Think about that. If I know about that, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin sure as hell does. Gorbachev himself, in a book he wrote in 2016, not so long ago, talked about the United States has a desire to keep Russia half strangled for as long as possible. Now, these are obviously views of particular people, and you will need to make your own mind up about this sort of argument. The second point is Gorbachev's, Putin's bitter resentment of the expansion of NATO within uh, spitting distance of Russia, to use a phrase by Roderick Braithwaite, the British ambassador to Moscow from 89 to 94, I believe. And again, I commend his writings. This man really understands his Russia in a way that many Americans do not. Little footnote. Our great and powerful ally is not good at understanding other countries. Why? Because America is an empire unto itself. Look at the poor analysis of the Vietnam War. Look at the poor analysis of the Afghanistan War. And look at the poor analysis when the Soviet Union, we all knew in this town, was disintegrating from about 86 on and as late as uh, 88, 89, Robert Gates, the CIA, was talking about the Soviet Union being ready to outstrip America in every aspect of military power. My discussions with him in 88. Give you some examples of geography, and I'm not saying that this should be uh, accepted, but just give you th three examples which we Australians who live on a continent a fair distance away from most things don't understand. Now as a defence planner, if you told me that Australia here in Canberra, we had a foreign power equipped with Sukhoi 35 Soviet jets down in Cooma, there would be a reaction in the defence establishment. That is the distance from the eastern Estonian border to St. Petersburg, 145. What's the distance from the northern Ukrainian border to Moscow, 
400 kilometres, the distance from Sydney to Wagga. Just think about it. It's not to excuse what's happening, but it's to understand there are different perspectives. Again, what I'm about to quote, there are different views on, but from one of these books, I've checked the end note. And this is a conversation that James Baker, the Secretary of State, in 1990, had with um, Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor of Germany. And he, there's a copy of that in Kohl's um, archives, and the quotation is that from that, because it was sent to Kohl the day after Baker talked to Gorbachev and said, Gorby, I know you're going to accept the unification of Germany, but just think about it. A neutral, independent Germany could be hard to control. If you agree with me a unified Germany is part of NATO, I will not see the boundaries of NATO expand one inch further eastwards. Now, there are some journalists in this town who say there's no such evidence. Well, I would have thought a letter in Cole's archives is sufficient for that issue. Third, there's Putin's con condescending attitude to Ukraine. I won't take you through the long history of those two countries. It's not possible in the time available. But Ukraine is derived from an old Russian word meaning on the periphery. You've got to remember that the Russians came down into what is now Ukraine in the late 1700s when um, Catherine the Great was the Tsar of all the Russias. Um, the part of southern Russia to which uh, Russia expanded was called Nova Russia, New Russia. Putin uses it all the time. And the people who were there were a mixture of Ukrainians, Cossacks, and guess what? Ottomans, Turkey, hence the Crimean War. Ukraine also means, in the modern version, beyond the borders. Putin wrote a paper, allegedly, July last year, 7,000 words long, I do not commend it to you. <laughs> it's on the historical unity of Russian and Ukrainian people, who, and I quote, are one people sharing the same historical and spiritual space, meaning the Church of um, the Orthodox Church. And his aim is to create something that Solzhenitsyn, who you all remember, the dissident writer, in the Soviet Union, something that Solzhenitsyn uh, commended before he died and as the Soviet Union was breaking up. A Slav entity, the core Slav entity of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. You can give away Kazakhstan, the Central Asian Republics, all that stuff, but that, that was Solzhenitsyn's view. You would wonder where Putin now stands with we are one people sharing historical and spiritual space. He's humiliated the Ukrainian people. And you know, there are a lot of people in places like Kharkiv who have relatives just across the border. Um, the eastern part of Ukraine is basically predominantly Russian speaking, old Soviet heavy industries, steel, iron, um, in the old days, ICBMs and Russian Orthodox. The western part to the west of the uh, Dnieper River, uh, uh, basically Ukrainian speaking, the farther west you go, the more Polish influence from history, um, more rural, and a Orthodox faith called the Uniate Orthodox faith, which owes its allegiance to the Pope, which the Moscow faith certainly does not. And one of my views is that maybe he's seeking Putin to divide uh, Ukrainian half because you can't occupy a country the size of France with 44 million. So if you look at the, the battle plan maps that have been published now, maybe that's one approach. I'm just guessing. Fourth, and this is really important to understand in addition to those three points, Putin's aim is to reconstruct Russia as a great power, Velikaya Dejava. His view is that without dominance over Ukraine, 
Russia cannot be a great power and that a Ukraine closely associated with NATO, even if it remains outside the alliance, is a national security threat to Russia. Now again, I'm not endorsing this. I'm reporting to you what we know he thinks and what his stance is. M my personal view is it's going to be hard for him to climb down of this battle which is not looking so good. Most of us, including me, thought Kiev three days. So did the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in closed advice to the Congress recently. Um, it's taking a lot longer now. We're at day three weeks tomorrow. Um, there's clearly problems of uh, logistics, fuel and ammunition, basic stuffs. The Russians have always been bad at that, but they've had plenty of time to prepare for this. They built up, you know, October, November, December, January, February. Russian traditional history is you don't split your military into little penny packets of what's called tactical battalion attack groups. And he's got several of those in all directions trying to attack Kiev. We all thought he would just build up, as they did at Stalingrad, overwhelming force, very patiently, take a lot of casualties, and then let rip with massive artillery, which is what happened at Stalingrad. And that may be about what's to happen, I'm guessing again, uh, in uh, Kiev. I noticed this morning that President Zelensky has acknowledged, it is said, that the Ukraine will not become a, a member of NATO. If so, we need to ask ourselves, is that part of the so-called bilateral negotiations that are going on? Putin has made it clear over Christmas, New Year, he sent two uh, internationally um, argued treaties. One was to the United States. This is an international guarantee that the United States will never, ever make Ukraine a member of NATO. The other one was sent to NATO saying the same thing. Now, you and I know that is not possible, unless I'm wrong, for um, NATO to say no. Even if Ukraine wants to be a member, we're not going to allow it to happen. But it may just be now there's a sort of chink appearing if what Zelensky is reported to have said yesterday is correct. Let's all hope that there is something, but you want my bottom line, Putin wants internationally guaranteed treaties, not words, and he wants to retain Crimea as part of Holy Mother Russia and the um, Donetsk, Lugansk, so-called People's Republics. How is he going to look if he agrees to something where he doesn't get those? He, you know, for him, he said, the red line is NATO membership. The red line. So that brings me to my fifth point. To put it crudely, how to get rid of Putin. There are two options. One is a popular uprising. The second is a palace coup. My friend who's just out of Carnegie Foundation, who's just gone back to America, gone to live in America, um, dismisses both those options. He is a passionate Russian citizen. His mother was born in Kiev, he lived in Kiev, but he's arguing against the possibility, why? We all know what Putin does with dissidents, look what he's about to do with Navalny, give him another 13 years. We know the brutality of the Russian police, you've seen it on your TV. And when you go in any case outside of the elites, the intellectuals and the people who are officials in Moscow and Petersburg to rural Russia, guess what? The only media they get is the Russian propaganda and you see them being reported on TV, these sort of people, out in rural Siberia. We believe what our government says. We were provoked. This is all America's fault. The Americans are about to use biological weapons. And we're only just starting to see in that famous incident we've just seen on TV of somebody in a television studio displaying words um, that say different things and just watch what's going to happen to her. And you also need to remember, in addition 
to the military and the intelligence community, the security organs of the state, Putin created a group called Rosgvardia, the Russian Guards. They are directly responsible to their commander-in-chief, who is guess whom? Vladimir Vladimirovich. And how many people are there in this Russian Guard? How about 340,000? Think about that. I mean, we have no idea. It's like geography. We in Australia have no idea of some of these other issues. A palace coup? In the Soviet Union, even under Stalin, there was a Politburo, a political bureau. We'd call it a cabinet. Stalin ignored it, of course. But relevant to this argument, you remember how Khrushchev was deposed. He was on holiday in the Crimea because of the silly things he talked about burying the West with nuclear weapons. The Politburo voted him out. There is no Politburo. He listens to only the people who agree with him and he's increasingly physically distant. You've seen the photos of the famous table and Macron. You've seen the, the video of Putin talking to his National Security Council and ridiculing them, including his chief of intelligence. To use an old-fashioned term, he's drinking his own bathwater and he's getting more and more remote and there's less and less contradictory advice. So unless, and I notice Minister Dutton implied that there might be an internal issue. Well, with due respect, Minister, unless you have, and the Americans have, an agent inside the Kremlin, you ain't going to get it, and even then. I hope Dutton's right, but I just want to leave you with the thought, this is not going to be at all easy. So finally, um, Dennis and I would like to discuss with you what the implications are for Australia, for the United States and Europe, and indeed for China. Um, I just want to leave you with the thought that I mentioned earlier. China and Russia are in a quasi alliance. Russia is now supplying high performance leading edge technology, which it used not to to China. I mean Sukhoi 35s, I mean Kilo class quiet diesel electric submarines, I mean the S400 air defense system, probably the best air defense system in the world, and Last year, Putin agreed to build for Xi Jinping a ballistic missile early warning radar, which will make America's capacity to penetrate um, nuclear missiles into China a bit more complicated. Um, it's not an alliance like NATO. There's no Article 5, you know, an attack on one is an attack on all. But don't underrate this relationship. And as I left home um, this morning, um, and I know that most of you from the media will be across this, the US National Security Advisor, um, Jake Sullivan, um, spent seven hours with the most senior Chinese diplomat, I've forgotten his name, previously foreign minister, seven hours. And part of the brawl was the National Security Advisor of the United States threatening the Chinese representative if you, as is being whispered, are going to supply economic and military aid to a Russia that has just been castigated by the UN General Assembly, then there are going to be repercussions for you. And I think on that note, just as a lighter note, I just want to tell you a Russian joke. <laughs> Wait for it. So it's the year 2040. Two Russians are walking along together. One says to the other, do you remember in 2020, we said that China will never attack us as they both crossed the Sino-Finnish border. <laughs>
And second, um, you talked about the state of um, the uh, US's, uh, the Soviet military and nuclear arsenal at the time of the end of the uh, Soviet Union. What's your assessment of its military capacity now? Let me take the first one, the last one first. Um, I don't see the classified stuff anymore, but by gee, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the public domain. You look at the details that was released by America just a few weeks ago, uh, it could only have come from overhead intelligence, satellite photography, um, electronic intercepts, and what have you. Um, some people, including me, I thought the Russians would be better. They performed badly in Georgia, um, but then Putin has been throwing money um, at the military. Um, let's remember the economy until these sanctions is in reasonable shape. $700 billion US of foreign currency reserves, which of course he can't now use. And oil, he needs oil to be at the price of $40 a barrel to, for his national budget to break even. What's the price right now? 100. But they've performed badly. And whether it's to do with corruption, um, lack of training by the senior generals, I mean, you'd think right now uh, he would be um, uh, saying to his generals, you're sacked, you're sacked, you're sacked. You can all go and live in Siberia. Because somebody has let him down. Again, something I read this morning, which I haven't been able to check out, is the fifth department of the Foreign Intelligence Organization has just had its head and deputy head removed for providing, it is said, poor intelligence on the inside of Ukraine. I mean, I think Putin did expect to be, be met with flowers and all that sort of stuff. And is this going to cause him to um, reflect? I doubt it. I don't think he's that sort of man. He's a harsh man and he could go a lot further. Um, there is the nuclear risk. Um, but um, your first part of the question? Was about ambitions beyond yes. the Slavic state, shall we say? Well, if you talk to the ambassadors in this town of Latvia, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, yeah, they're building up the force that they're asking for more forward-based American British and German forces, but frankly, if the Russian military couldn't ride over each one of those countries in a couple of days, that would surprise me. Not that I think that should be encouraged. These are vibrant democracies. Ukraine is a democracy. It changes leaders. It is pretty badly corrupt, and I think there are question marks about the um, independence of the judiciary. But um, he wouldn't easily take on NATO unless he believes that Biden is all hot air and no follow through. And we've se seen what Biden has said about no, no troops uh, in Ukraine or anywhere else. Um, just one final point. Um, you know the Russians have now taken over the whole of the um, uh, southern Black Sea coast. It remains to take Odessa, uh, a magnificent 19th century um, Jewish intellectual city in the past. Next door to that is a place called Moldova, a country. Russia has had troops in a part of that called Transnistria um, for 30 odd years. Wouldn't that be easy? Um, a natural flow on from that, Dennis Richardson, is about the US. Uh, what's your assessment about the way the US has dealt with this crisis? As Paul says, uh, the Putin assessment is that US is, the US is a uh, power in decline. What's your reading of the way they've responded to this and what their options are? Well, Laura, um, for what it's worth, I think the US has done this reasonably well up till now. If you consider what the US is seeking to balance out, it's got at one extreme the possibility of a nuclear war, as unlikely as what that might be, uh, we are as close to it as what we've been to for a long time. It's, it's, it's uh, had to work very hard to get, a, uh, to get unity in Europe, and I think it has achieved a certain unity in Europe in terms of their preparedness to impose tough sanctions on Russia mm. beyond what I think a lot of people thought uh, three months ago. They've also needed to measure out the support they give to Ukraine uh, and its military. I think they've done that reasonably well. Uh, you can debate whether 
Biden should have taken uh, force off the table when he did. You can debate whether Biden should have had a different response to the Polish proposal to give their MiGs to Ukraine and in return get F-16s from the US. You can debate those, uh, those issues, but I think overall uh, the US management of it up till now has been pretty good. One other point that I think is worth making, and that is we've talked a lot about Russia, the US and the like. This is a big moment for Western Europe, and you might say, well, of course it is. Uh, the big question is, is this the point at which Germany gets rid of the psychological shackles to which it's been hostage since the Second World War? Mm. Because the big question is, does Germany step up in providing leadership uh, in Europe? So far, it's done it. But, you, but I don't think we'll be able to make a real judgment about it for another year or so. Will Germany maintain uh, the sanctions over the long term? Finally, I think it's worth I, I think it's worth making the point that as poorly as what the Russians appear to have performed up till now, uh, Putin, as Paul has said, Putin will not give up, and. Uh, Putin may well achieve uh, his objective of, one, splitting the Ukraine and, secondly, ensuring that uh, Ukraine does not become a member of NATO. Mm. If he achieves those objectives and there are not long-term sanctions or long-term punishment imposed by the United States and Europe, then you could argue Putin wins. Does the failure, or I suppose I should reframe that, is it a failure of both American and European strategic thinking that we've got to this point? Did they underestimate Putin's ambition? Um, did they not sort of really have it in their, clearly enough in their eyes, possibly in the US case because they've been so focused on China or because of Donald Trump's relationship with Putin? I think that America fumbled the ball right from the disintegration of Russia. It could have been done differently in a more accommodating way when there was some hope <laughs> in the early Yeltsin years. But let me remind you, Yeltsin, dare I say, was a drunken Siberian peasant. If you, uh, yes, but if we could just bring it forward to the last, say, four or five years. Yes. Yeah. It that. has been... I think in the early Putin days when he made the visit to the discussions with NATO and there was still some talk about, you know, inherited from Gorbachev about you know, Europe from Ireland to Vladivostok, that sort of stuff. Um, and he, was, he, he talked a bit about that in round about the, the first, I think it was 2005, he came to power in 2000. But now... He has turned away from Europe before all this, this war. He deliberately turned away. He believed that they were weak and disintegra disintegrating. And he turned to a move eastwards. He embraces the idea called Eurasia, which I think is a bullshit term, to use an academic expression. Um, but, you know, he and his, and his advi geopolitical advisers think like that. And that's where they're teamed with China on the Shanghai cooperation thing. He's turned deliberately away. And now I think, as, as Dennis said, there's no shift in this man now. It's all too late, I think. Next question is from David Crow. Thank you, Laura, and thank you both for your remarks. Um, I have um, one thing on the top of my mind I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on, which is whether a no-fly zone over Ukraine is at all feasible, is at all possible. But I think the broader point is, given um, Paul, what you said about no palace coup or popular uprising against Putin. Um, is there anything that can be done now further that gives him a way to relent or step back um, uh, in a way that, um, that he, can, he can achieve, in a sense, giving him an avenue for retreat? And on the question of China, 
is there any way in which the West can deal with China at the moment? Perhaps, Dennis, this is a great one for you. On China, is there any way to deal with China at the moment where we can make it possible for them to soften their support for Russia, if not exactly cut the ties? Well, I'll, I'll take China uh, first. Um, Russia and China share a strategic objective in weakening US global leadership, power and also alliance structures that have been in place for a long time. Um, the joint statement signed on the 4th of February talked about a no limits relationship and of course there's no such thing as a no limits relationship. We've already seen that China had a limit in not voting for Russia in the United Nations. So China has already articulated silently that there are limits. I think China will give what support it can to Russia uh, that it thinks it can get away with. Uh, I think I would have thought there's very little prospect of China at this point seeking to be a mediator between Ukraine and Russia. I don't think it would see, its, see it as being in its own interests. Uh, China has this funny position where it, one, recognises Ukrainian sovereignty, but on the other hand, acknowledges that uh, Russia had legitimate security issues, which by implication means it was justified in going into the Ukraine. A great capacity to carry two contradictory thoughts in its head at the one time. Uh, so I think China will work with Russia and help Russia to the extent that it thinks it can get away with it. I agree with that. Um, Look, I'm not a technical expert on no-fly zones. Um, even if you're prohibiting uh, fighter aircraft and bombers, just yesterday the, the, the Russians launched, I think it was seven missiles from one of their long-range strategic bombers in, in Russian airspace onto um, Lvov or wherever it was in the western part of Ukraine. Uh, so in any case, missiles, does that come within it? Secondly, um, if you were Putin, you know, getting back into his mind again, so you see this, and they've never been friendly with, with Poland for all sorts of reasons, historical, religious, you name it. Uh, you see MiG-29s that you have made coming out of Poland and being run by the Ukrainians. Uh, here comes another piece of geography. So from the western border of Belarus, an ally of Russia now, from the western border of Belarus to Warsaw is how far? 140 kilometres. Guess what Putin would do? Drop one, in my view. Putin, I mean, I think we've got to be careful, and I know you're not suggesting this. There's no way of appeasing this man except utter abject surrender. I think his bottom line is, and I know I've said this at least twice before, and let me say it again. He wants some form of guarantee about Ukraine and NATO, and not a spoken guarantee, um, that was the spoken guarantee about the one inch further eastwards that James Baker, you know, offered. He'd want a written international treaty. Secondly, he'd want to hold on to, at the very least, Crimea and the Donetsk Basin. As he defines it, Lugansk um, uh, 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 and Donetsk, part of the, the, the basin of which the territorial limits are about another 70% of land westward. And I'm guessing he'd want that included. How would Zelensky handle that? Thanks. Julie here. <clears throat> Julie here from the Australian Financial Review and a director of the National Press Club. Thank you so much. Um, I think you kind of just answered my question, which was we've heard a lot about, you know, um, Putin and Russia's response, but I was wondering how you rated Zelensky and the military response within the Ukraine. And if it is, as you say, just what he wants is just total surrender, then what, when do you expect sanctions to be in place against Russia? Um, you know, could we be talking about a decade or more? And uh, will 
the old Russia become a pariah state um, if it doesn't withdraw? Like, how, how does the West deal with that situation? Dennis? No. no. Um, I dismissed the sanctions early on, because when I was in Moscow five years ago, when the sanctions about MH17 and Crimea and Donbass were being imposed, there was no signs of any problem in the vibrant modern city called Moscow. As soon as you went into the countryside, there were issues. Since then, Putin has deliberately encouraged Russian farming and other things to be more self-sufficient. Hmm? Uh, but now, um, and I've been seeing Dennis's comment on this, the, the size and nature, particularly of the financial sanctions, the SWIFT system, the inability to move your $700 billion worth of foreign exchange around, you know, um, the impact on the oligarchs and some of Putin's best friends. And you've seen, by the way, in the, the um, totally Russian London suburb of Kensington, not a cheap <laughs> suburb, some demonstrators have occupied some of the houses of the oligarchs, wouldn't you? Um, they will bite now these sanctions, but you know, can the oligarchs actually you know, get their heads together and overthrow him? I could be terribly wrong. I hope I am. I don't think so. I just don't. Uh, I might add to that that I think Putin's propensity to absorb pain will be greater than the propensity of Western countries to absorb pain. Mm. He's authoritarian. He doesn't face elections. He doesn't have to worry about petrol prices. He doesn't have to worry about cost of livings. Uh, that is, and that's not just a reference to what we see in Australia today. Uh, the US will face midterm elections in November. Between now and then, they have their driving season and the summer holiday. Petrol prices are already starting to bite there. And uh, liberal democracies always um, uh, a question about pain thresholds, pressure on governments and the like. Mm. Over the longer term, they're the stronger, but certainly over the next few years, Putin will be prepared to suffer more pain than, than what the West will be. Mm. Yeah. Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Um, Obviously, the uncertainty has been drawn into the upcoming election here. Um, I have a sort of current, a forward-looking question about the capability gap before the nuclear-powered submarines are ready. Mr Richardson, what do you think Australia should do about that capability gap in the meantime? And secondly, I think you started at Defence um, a few months after the Gillard government budget outlined $5.5 billion in savings in Defence over four years. Uh, defence spending as a share of GDP dropped to 1.59%. Do you have any sort of view about the impact of that and whether the strategic view was right for the times at that point? Well, first of all, I started in defence in October of 2012. So I was there in the lead up to the budget. Uh, sorry, the budget uh, that reduced it was... There was, there was one in, yeah, May 2012. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and then, and then, yeah. All right, okay. Uh, that sole budget is not the reason why we have a problem now, quite obviously. Um, the 2013 Defence White Paper did commit the Labor government to increasing the defence budget to 2% of GDP. In other words, the Labor government learnt from the criticism it legitimately got following the 11-12 budget. In terms of capability gaps, we simply need, well, first of all, I think it's exaggerated. I think everyone in this town's running around like blue house, um, um, uh, blue flies, <laughs> I should say. Uh, and I, I think it is exaggerated. I could go into the detail for that, uh, but I won't bother. But in terms of submarines, first of all, we failed to keep in place a sophisticated design team for submarines after the last of the Collins was built in the early 2000s. Secondly, we failed to press the button on new submarines in the period between 2007 and 2013. Uh, so from 2013 on, it was inevitable, 
that, uh, that we would face a problem in terms of the life of the Collins and what comes afterwards. And that's the game that's been played out since. I actually think the decision to acquire nuclear-powered submarines is absolutely the correct one and the right one. If we have two nuclear-powered submarines in the water by 2044, we would have two nuclear-powered submarines in the water and we would have three Collins class in the water. That is greater capability than what we have today. Thank you. Anna Henderson. Thank you. Anna Henderson, SBS World News. Uh, firstly, this morning the Defence Minister has given a speech and said uh, it's becoming clear that Putin's Ukrainian gamble has been a miscalculation that may very well destroy the man himself. I wanted to know if you agree with that assessment. And secondly, you mentioned Pine Gap. Uh, given the world is changing, the environment that we're working and living in is changing and we're a liberal and open democracy, is it time to own up to what actually happens there? And how much control does Australia have over that facility's operations? Does it have access to every part of that facility, in your understanding? OK, first of all, we do have access uh, to the different parts of that facility. Any claim to the contrary is rubbish. Secondly, the deputy head of Pine Gap is an Australian. Mm. Uh, American Congress men and women have visited Pine Gap, I know this as of fact, and on at least two occasions have got back to Washington and queried American officials as to what the hell they were doing being, being briefed by Australians. Mm -hmm. Because on at least one visit, uh, the, uh, the American head of Pine Gap wasn't there and he was replaced by the deputy who was always an Australian. Uh, so I don't think we should use this occasion to start furfies yet again about Pine Gap. But I guess the, the further question, if I may, is should there be more transparency to the Australian public about what happens there, given, as we understand it from the little that we know, there is a lot that goes on there that possibly has to do with what's happening right now? Um, Kim Beasley articulated in the mid-1980s Mm. Uh, the reason and the purpose of Pine Gap, and that remains the case today. And I agree with that. I had that clearance for 30 years, including 13 years as a professor at the ANU. Um, I was with Beasley when we negotiated that, um, that the chief of station would be the CIA person. They invented the satellite, by the way, and it was world cutting edge. There was nothing like it. Uh, secondly, there's uh, Dennis has said the deputy will always be Australian. Thirdly, we negotiated that when I was deputy secretary, we'd always have people on the shop floor. Now, you can't scrutinise all of it, but we can please ourselves which parts we examine. We, what Beasley and the Hawke government did in um, 86, we set out in detail, and I commend it to you, the 87 white paper, which I helped to write, sets it out in detail about what it does for arms control and, and disarmament. Uh, and we had to convince people like Bill Hayden on, on that issue. So the, 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 I would have every reason to expect, and I no longer have the clearance, that right now it's rather busy. But we negotiated that deal with the Americans. I also had the uh, clearance for men with Hill in Yorkshire, similar but much smaller. Um, that was an American Air Force operation until quite recently. And if I may just draw you to the beginning of my very long question, I'm sorry, uh, in relation to what the Defence Minister has said today, do you think that the invasion of Ukraine could be Putin's undoing, given what you've said already? I simply hope that Mr Dutton is right. <laughs> and I echo that. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> Dominic Giannini. Um, Dominic Giannini from the Australian Associated Press. Thank you both um, for speaking here today. Um, just expanding about what you said about propensity for pain in democracies. We've heard from the US and Australia would support this in lockstep um, that we would act against China should they help um, Russia. 
should China believe that Australia has the propensity to sanction without retaliation that would harm our economy more? And then just building on from that, um, closer to home, we've spoken about the politicisation of national security. Coming up to our own election, as you mentioned, the US midterms, um, Warnings have appeared to fall and on deaf ears with politicians fighting for seats and, and fighting for government. How do we make sure that politicians and rhetoric don't wreck our long-term national interests? At the end of the day, politicians are ultimately very responsible. I mean that as a genuine comment. Um, let's, get a, let's work through a few things. First of all, it's legitimate for there to be differences on national security in a liberal democracy. There always have been. There were differences over the Vietnam War, there were differences over the Iraq War, etc. I took issue with the, with the attempt by the government to create the perception of a difference on China where in fact there was none and I didn't see that as consistent with our national interests. Beyond that, however, um, uh, I hope there is debate, an act of debate, on matters of national security. That's as it should be in a liberal democracy. That doesn't weaken us. I suspect Putin would be in a, in a better position today <laughs> if there was a bit more debate and questioning uh, within his own system. Mm. Um, Paul? No, I, I can't do any more than that. I'm not an expert on sanctions and uh, 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 the issue about China and Russia, just let me to come back to that. Um, the classical way in a three-party balance of power, America, China and Russia, will be for the West to try and detach Russia from China, because Russia is the junior partner of China. What's the figure for the GDP? China's GDP is 10 or 20 times more than Russia's, which is about the size of Italy's. Um, I think the issue there is we obviously can't now have any prospect in the long foreseeable future of detaching Russia. Question, can we somehow or other detach China? And I must say my initial reaction to that is dream on. Uh, could, could I just intervene before we go to the next question on that? Um, one thing we haven't discussed is uh, what are the risks, if you like, for China in... Uh, arming and supporting Russia. I mean, it has an interest in Russia not becoming too p powerful or aggressive, doesn't it? Or, or does the fact that, as you say, it's so much bigger than Russia, it doesn't really matter? Dennis? No, no. no. I know Russians who are very uncomfortable with the relationship. Let's remember, if you go back through history, you know, Stalin kept Mao Zedong waiting for months at the dacha when the communist revolution had just occurred in 49 in China. Stalin was the leader of world communism. Then they signed um, an alliance and it was called the Lips and the Teeth. And uh, I've got uh, on my door at the university a poster from that period and it has uh, a Russian and a Chinese and the Chinese man has his arms around a Russian boy and the Russian man has his arms round a Chinese girl. And in Russian it says, Segda v mestia, always together. Well, that alliance ended up with Russia threatening to drop nuclear weapons on the Chinese in 1968 on an island on the Amur Usuri River. And it was dangerous stuff. The, the, the Russians actually approached the Americans, how would you react if? Then there was this long sort of period where um, Russia disintegrated, it was nothing much. China was racing ahead. We'd taken our eyes off China, hadn't we? For 20 years, Lord help us, we are in Afghanistan and Iraq, and what was China doing? Making hay while the sun shines. And I think the situation now is, could we in any way lure China away? I'm not a China expert. I find it hard to imagine. Sarah Bashford Canales. Hi, Sarah Bashford Canales from the Canberra Times. Thank you both for sharing your insights. Um, historically, we saw the US and its allies <clears throat> arm the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in its war against Russia decades ago. Later, members of the, that group um, formed extremist terrorist groups or, or joined terrorist groups and committed acts and atrocities against a number of Western nations. 
Um, are, we like, are we likely to see a similar story unfold from Ukraine in the years to come as former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has already noted? And what assurances should the federal government and defence give to ensure ADF weapons don't fall into the hands of motivated extremist groups within Russia, oh sorry, within Ukraine? Well, I think there's a limit to what any government can do in terms of maintaining control over weaponry it gives to another country, particularly in a conflict situation. So I think we ought to be realistic on that front. Yes, bad things might happen down the track as a result of the arms that are now flowing uh, into Ukraine. However, from my own personal perspective, that is something that will need to be managed and addressed if and when the time comes. The challenge now is Putin's unprovoked and blatant aggression against a sovereign state for no reason except for the ones outlined by Paul uh, in his address. That is not something we should, uh, we should support. And if there is a risk that down the track arms might uh, fall into the wrong hands, then so be it. Ellen Ransley. Ellen Ransley from NCA Newswire. Thank you both for your address today. Um, just going back on to China, if I can, just following up on what you said before. Um, you've said it's a bit of a dream to separate China and Russia, but if China does continue to support Russia and Australia does begin to impose sanctions, what implications would that have on the Australian economy? Is it too much of a risk to Australia and the Indo-Pacific to impose any sanctions? Well, I, I think we're, we're getting into the realm of, I think, speculation at the moment. I've, my own personal view is that China will support Russia, but I think it will measure out that support in a way that probably keeps it below what might be the sanctions threshold for the US. So it would surprise me if, if we got to the point where sanctions were being imposed mm. on China. I think China will operate in a grey area, in a murky area, and it will be difficult to actually uh, uh, catch China with its hands in the till, sufficient for sanctions to be imposed. Laura, if I might just add something a bit tangent to that. I agree with all that. What I haven't raised with you is, in the past, my view was uh, Xi Jinping, remembering that he and Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin are the closest of friends. They've seen each other 30 times in a few years. That Xi Jinping will be scrutinising in exquisite detail how much Putin is getting away with the use of military force against a sovereign country across sovereign boundaries. And what does that mean for Xi Jinping in regard to shall he warm it up with regard to Taiwan? But there are some issues, aren't there? It's one thing to cross land borders, and the Russians have clearly found that a bit of a challenge. The Taiwan Straits is 160 kilometres across. This is not the English Channel. This is serious stuff. And any Chinese amphibious assault would be totally vulnerable to impossible to detect, dare I say it, American nuclear attack submarines. Impossible to detect. I would have thought that Xi Jinping, and I'm guessing, is having a look at also the reaction of the Western world, America, Europe, us, some countries like Japan in Asia, thinking, I never thought the West would get its act together like that. I'm guessing, but it makes it more complicated for him, I would have thought. Nick Stewart. <clears throat> Dennis, you've worked with governments of both persuasions. Do you think that either in the Kremlin or in Zhonglinhai in, in Beijing, that the, either uh, group, groups over there are likely to prefer or really one worry or care 
about who wins the next Australian election. Do you think that, that one is a preferred party of the other? And just before I finish, uh, Paul, can I ask you, you, you made the point that, that the invasion hasn't gone to plan, obviously. Um, do you think that, that actually Putin is now recalibrating and thinking, well, I don't need to be worried if um, uh, people die, and he will be just prepared to keep bombing Kiev until um, uh, he res achieves what he wants. Mm. Uh, in answer to the first part of your question, Nicholas, I mean, the obvious response is that uh, the Chinese and the Russians don't get to vote uh, in, a, in Australia. It's the first point I'd make. Uh, secondly, um, governments around the world always have views on who they would like to see win an election, here or there. Uh, I've heard prime ministers express uh, a preference for an outcome in another country. Uh, and I've heard officials from other countries express a preference for an outcome here. But one, they don't get a vote. Secondly, uh, decent countries don't seek to interfere. Uh, they rarely say anything publicly, being aware that if they say something publicly, seeking to influence the outcome of an election in another country, it normally works against their preference, such as President Obama's comments about Brexit. Um, so I don't... It, it's, it, it, is, it is an interesting issue, but it's a parlour game rather than uh, an issue of real life. <laughs> and Nicholas, you and I go back to Friday nights drinking... <laughs> I can't remember any of that either. <laughs> Neither can I. <laughs> You're implying, and there's truth in this, that you know historically Russians have taken deaths. Let, let's rem remind ourselves: the Russians lost 27 million dead in the Second World War. 27 million. 12 million of those were soldiers; the others were civilians. Um, and they still celebrate victory over Hitler's Germany as the primary celebration, not the Bolshevik Revolution these days. And you know, there's this memorial thing where they carry photographs of their fathers, grandfathers, mothers, whatever. Uh, and Putin is a strong supporter of that because it adds to Russia's sense of itself. However, I remember when the Russians were nine years in um, Afghanistan, we watched. Um, the divisions come in and the Airborne Assault Division, uh, the 76 Airborne Assault Division out of Peskov drop into Kabul and kill the communist leadership and install a new communist leadership. Those, the deaths of, of over 15,000 is what they admitted to, it's probably more like 30,000 over nine years, were flown home secretly in zinc coffins unmarked. The mothers were so, told to shut up and if we hit, get reports you're talking about this, there'll be consequences. And here is so many thousands of rubles. What I'm about to tell you, I can't tell you the source, but it's an impeccable source. What, when you ask Ukrainians at reasonably influential levels, so this Russian army has still got conscripts, about 30%. The others are professionals. The conscripts are as young as 17. They weren't told that they were going to attack Ukraine. They were told they're going on an exercise. And you've seen them in the video shots. They're crying. They're young men. So this Ukrainian source, impeccable source, said to me quite recently, I said, so what do you do with these young boys, the many boys? We impound their iPhone. We ask for their mother's telephone number in Russia. We ring her and say, we've got your son, Ivan. He's safe. Please come and pick him up. Isn't that smart? That is lateral. The word will get around. Now, will it, will it have any inf impact on Putin? No. Nothing. He's impermeable to that. He has no soul. We have to leave it there, but please thank Paul Dibb yeah. and Dennis Richardson.